From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. What to watch for as Georgia voters go to the polls for the Senate runoff between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, editorial board member Mane Ukwe-Barua and columnist Kim Strassel. The 2022 midterm elections finally come to a close today, Tuesday. And although Democrats have already retained control of the Senate, the question now is whether the chamber will remain split at 50-50, as it has been for the past two years, which would be a remarkable stalemate, or whether Democrats will win one more seat and make it a decisive 51-49 split. Let's start today with a couple clips from each side. Here's President Obama endorsing Senator Raphael Warnock and Georgia Governor Brian Kemp telling people to go vote for Herschel Walker. He's been a clear voice in the fight to defend our democracy and protect the right to vote. There aren't a lot of people in Washington like Reverend Warnock, and that's exactly why we need to send him back. This is going to be a close race, and we can't afford to get it wrong. So make your voice heard. Please join me in supporting Raphael Warnock for Senate. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I need you to show up one more time. Hey, Georgia, it's election day. Today, your vote is going to decide who's going to be in the United States Senate for the next six years. Do you want to send somebody back that's voted with Joe Biden 96% of the time, or do you want to send somebody that's going to fight to end 40-year high inflation, to lower gas prices, secure our southern border, and cut your taxes versus raising them. That's why I voted for Herschel Walker. I wanna encourage you to do the same. We gotta have a big turnout today to win this thing. Let's get it done and send someone like Herschel to the United States Senate that is gonna fight for us. Manet, you were just in Georgia doing some reporting. So what did you see and what is the story of this runoff? Well, first of all, I think that those two clips you played, the first one of President Obama and the second of Governor Kemp, are very revealing of the way the race is shaping up. Because in that Obama ad, there was no real mention of the Biden agenda, which is ostensibly what Warnock would be reelected to support. They really are not running on that, especially now that they've maintained control of the Senate. They're trying to make the race basically a referendum on the character of the two candidates, Warnock on one hand and Herschel Walker, the Republican, on the other hand. They know that Herschel Walker has been really hurt by some personal stories, domestic abuse in his family, these allegations that he paid for the abortions of two women who he had been involved with in the past. And they believe that those kinds of things are going to discourage Republicans from coming out to support him, which they probably did do in the general election. So they're really kind of leaning into that. Whereas on the other hand, you do see the Walker campaign very reasonably saying there's going to be a big difference for the Republican Party, depending on whether we have 49 versus 50 seats, as I believe we'll talk about later, that does have implications for policy, for committee assignments, things like that. So that's one of their factors. And they're trying to just kind of appeal to more traditional voters in the state of Georgia in the more rural counties. They want to boost turnout in some of the more conservative suburbs around Atlanta, which are very populous. You still do have quite a lot of very conservative voters who are very disappointed that Georgia has shifted blue in the past few election cycles. So they're trying to see if they can help reclaim that seat and sort of reassert the Republican presence from Georgia in Congress. What is the role, Monet, that Trump is playing in this runoff? Of course, he endorsed Herschel Walker helped him get the Republican nomination. But especially after Trump endorsed candidates in November fared so poorly, it seemed like there was something of a tension for Herschel Walker between being Trump friendly enough not to get the burning tweet that would come his way potentially and not being too Trump friendly and turning off some voters who were turned off by Trump candidates in other states like New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out that Herschel Walker's relationship with Donald Trump is very different from some of the other candidates who ran on the Trump mantle in Republican primaries in 2022. Herschel Walker has known President Trump since the 1980s because he played on the New Jersey Generals, a USFL team that Trump owned 
And so they have this personal connection. It was Trump who really recruited Walker to run after Walker spoke on his behalf in the 2020 Republican convention. And so Walker certainly does owe his political candidacy to Trump in a certain effect. But I think that Trump has become somewhat unpopular in the state of Georgia, in part because that was one of the main states where Trump alleged that the vote had been stolen and basically was pushing uh, Governor Kemp to overturn the results of that election. So even a lot of conservative Republicans in the state are wary of Trump for that reason. Trump was unable to deliver Republican candidates victories in the runoff elections in the U.S. Senate after the 2020 elections. And so I think Walker very reasonably thinks that Trump's presence would hurt him more than it would help him. And so he's asked Trump not to campaign on his behalf in the state. Trump seems to have very willingly agreed because he thinks that it's possible Walker might lose and doesn't want his reputation to be hurt by having yet another one of the candidates who's primarily identified with him go down to defeat. And so Trump has kept his distance in the closing weeks of this race. Kim, what's your read of who has the momentum here, the way that the trends are going? Just as a reminder to people, in the general election in November, Senator Raphael Warnock had about a one-point lead over Herschel Walker. It was 49.4% to 48.5%. And of course, that wasn't above 50, which is what you need in order to avoid a runoff. But it was about a point split that Herschel Walker was down in November. Kim, what's your sense of how things have fared since then? If you look at just the traditional measures of this, there certainly seems to be momentum for Warnock at the moment. There's just basic things like he's had a lot more money in this race. He's outspent the Walker campaign. We're seeing a huge early vote, in particular long lines in Democratic heavy counties in and around Atlanta. Obviously, we know Democrats have historically tended to use early voting more than Republicans, and Republicans have tended to really rely on same-day turnout. But this does suggest that Warnock has been really building up some margins and in the areas that matter the most to a victory for him. He's obviously, as Manet said, got those Walker liabilities in terms of the personal story. He's been playing up the Trump ties. We also know Democrats are better at the harvesting, as it were, that early mail voting. Republicans, that was a big lesson that came out of this recent election was how far behind they are in that game. And they weren't ever going to be able to magically catch up in the few weeks since we had the general election. Now, on the other side, I would just point out a few things, though, that Walker potentially has going for him. As you noted, Kyle, the difference the first time around was very small. 38,000 votes separated the two candidates. And one of the reasons that the Walker campaign felt that they didn't do better is because of the presence in the last election of a libertarian named Shane Oliver. He is now out of the race because this is a runoff and there is some real hopes among the Walker campaign that they capitalize on his voters or at least enough of them, some of them. He's got Kemp really working for him this time, and that's going to be really important in some northern Atlanta exurbs, which lean Republican, but in which the last time around, Kemp really did a lot better than Walker. So if he can pull him along, that would help. And then for all that Trump is maybe a negative for Walker, Biden is a negative for Warnock. And it was very notable to me that Biden decided to go help Raphael Warnock this week by going to congratulate volunteers who were making phone calls for him in Massachusetts. He's not down in Georgia because the Warnock campaign does not want him there. And so we'll have to see. It's going to be close, I think. But right now, the momentum does certainly look to be more on the Democratic side. And just to clarify, so Georgia is not one of these states where ballot harvesting, meaning volunteers, sometimes partisan volunteers, are allowed to go door to door and take physical possession of people's ballots. Some states allow that. Some states have no restrictions. You can pick up as many ballots as you can carry and take them back to the recorder's office or the mailbox. Georgia has restrictions on that. You know, a voter with a physical disability can have their ballot returned by a family member. But Kim, I I take you to be referring more broadly to early vote operations, vote by mail operations, making sure that people get their mail requests in. And that leads me to ask whether Republicans need to get better at those kind of operations. So there's one figure that I've seen today, which is that early turnout in Georgia is heavily Democratic, 52 percent to 39 percent. 
And so based on that, there's some analysts that are projecting that in order for Herschel Walker to win, he has to win about 60 percent of the Election Day votes. And then they're floating things like the fact that there is rain forecast in Republican northern Georgia today on Tuesday. And Kim, I know that Republicans have objections to this kind of electioneering, that they think that mail votes are less secure and so forth. But if that's the law in a given state, Georgia is a state that allows no excuses mail voting. So anybody can request a mail ballot. You don't have to be out of town. You don't have to be sick like you do in other states like New York. I mean, if that's the law in Georgia, should Georgia Republicans decide that they're going to play the game, too? Absolutely. They have to unless they never want to win another election again or unless they're going to change the voting rules. And yes, ballot harvesting has now become kind of shorthand for everything that is involved in maximizing benefits for your party via mail-in voting. And you're right, the technical definition of harvesting is when you go door to door, pick up ballots and return them on behalf of people. But there was a lot that Democrats learned during the pandemic in the 2020 election in terms of helping people to get their requests in so that they got their ballots and then working to make sure those ballots were filled out and returned, even if outsiders didn't physically return them themselves. Things are a little bit tighter this year. There was a lot of outrage in 2020 over outside groups that because of pandemic loosening of election law. Laws. Some states and jurisdictions were sending out ballots more generally without requests. And there was some frustration that there were left leaning groups that were involved in that or making requests on behalf of people that were only going. So the ballots were only going to Democrats or more largely focused at Democrats. These are all things, as you say, every single state has its own different rules. But the reality is, is that I think since the pandemic, mail-in voting is here to stay and in a much bigger capacity than it ever has been in the past. And this is the new battlefront. And Republicans really ignored it again this election cycle and just said, yeah, you know, our people are going to show up on the day. And their people did show up on the day, but it wasn't enough to overcome some of these enormous margins that Democrats have banked during early voting and mail-in voting. And playing by the rules, I would add, does not mean that you have to stop arguing to change the rules. And maybe President Trump would understand that more if you were talking about taxes. I mean, Republicans, for example, a lot of them argue against the state and local tax deduction or the mortgage interest deduction as distortions on economic thinking. But as long as they are in existence, as long as they're in the law, I don't think that requires Republicans to, on their personal tax returns, to not take those deductions simply because they think those deductions ought not be in the law. Mm -hmm. 